Hello. We are going to get started here on Chapter 7. This is my newest recording of these lecture notes. Um, this is the first time I'm recording the whole lecture without being in front of the classroom. So if it seems a little bit um, uneven, I apologize. It's a little different recording on your own. All right, so Chapter 7 is the first chapter I'd like you to review when we're starting this course because it's all about the actual equipment. Um, including the tubes and the order of draw that we're going to be using. And then the next one we'll do is chapter eight. And I like to start with those two because we start lab right away. And those are the things we do in lab. So let's, I thought it would be best to start with the content that we're actually going to be physically working with in the lab first. And then we can get some more of the background information as we go. When you first open up the PowerPoint, you'll see the competencies um, that NACLS has identified. There's like a hundred of these and each chapter has which ones are aligned uh, from that list. We can talk more about who NACLS is in another chapter. Um, but they set educational standards for uh, program accreditation and approval. And then we have the objectives as they are listed by your chapter in your book. So you could find this in the first page of each chapter. So when you're looking in your book, you should find that the basic equipment that it's going to list is going to start with your draw station, your chairs, your equipment carriers, blah, blah, blah. We don't really care. I'm not going to go into too much detail about that stuff. Um, you do need to have a pair of gloves. Everybody needs gloves for every patient, new pair for every patient. You actually also need a new pair for every new um, procedure you're going to be doing. So. Granted, we're phlebotomists, we're only going to be doing one procedure, but if you happen to go on to become a nurse later on, you would want to know that if you're going to draw blood, that's one pair of gloves. If you're going to change a catheter, that's a new pair of gloves. If you're going to check their wound, that's another pair of gloves. So you always put on a new pair of gloves for new patients and for new procedures. We use, for just general, what we will we'll ever do, it's non-sterile gloves. They're disposable, and they can come in any number of different um, makes. Uh, latex is generally not used because a lot of people have allergies to them, so most places you'll see have latex-free everything. Uh, having gloves that fit is really, really important, although you can learn to do things with gloves that don't fit very well. Um, we generally try to avoid powdered gloves, and that has to do with, one, you can get your hands can get over-dried, and two, some of that powder can sometimes get out, get into the air, and potentially get into your specimen and contaminate it. It's more important if you're working down in the lab, but in general, most places where you work aren't going to stock powdered gloves. Oops, too far. So there's some pictures. Some of these are right out of your book. Some of them I got from the internet about different equipment. Um, antiseptics, that's a word you do need to use. You'll have to know the difference between that and disinfectants, which is on the next slide. Uh, an antiseptic is a substance that is used to prevent sepsis. Sepsis is like a body infection. Sepsis is the presence of microbes or their toxic products, the things that they make that gets into your bloodstream. If it's in your bloodstream, that means it's in your whole body. And if you have microbes or that stuff in there, that's an infection, right? So antiseptics prevent or inhibit the growth of microbes if they don't necessarily kill them. They're not, uh, excuse me, bactericidal. So they're safe for use on human skin. If we use something that would kill microbes, that's not gonna be safe for our skin. We have a lot of natural microbes and stuff that live on us. We just want to prevent them from being in our specimen. Generally, you're going to use 70% isopropyl alcohol. There are some other ones you can uh, look at in your book about uh, that people do use also. A disinfectant kills microbes, okay? It's used on stuff. Antiseptics are used on people. Disinfectants are used on things. We generally will use bleach. Um, if you're using a small area, cleaning a very small area, you could just use a 1 to 100 dilution. Generally, we're using a 1 to 10 dilution of bleach to water. Um, and that is what we'll find in our lab or most disinfectants. It's like that. It's an equivalent of that. And you need to let it be in contact with whatever you're cleaning for 10 minutes. So what we'll do sometimes is we'll put the bleach on the, on the table, for instance, and we'll wipe it up. And then we'll you know, clean area, and then we'll let the bleach sit on there. We'll like lay down a paper towel over it so that it can soak in and just stay there. That way it's not just a wet spot too, and you can see where the, the, the contact is. Hand sanitizers are totally okay to use instead of washing your hands. Um, in most cases, there are some listed here, such as when your hands are actually like you can see that they're dirty after you've used the bathroom, after you've been in someone's room that's on contact precautions. Whoops, I hit a button. Uh, that got cut off on my slide, sorry. After you've been eating, drinking, or smoking, um, or after you've used the hand sanitizer about 8 to 12 times, you'd want to actually wash your hands with soap and water. But if it's just in between patients, leaving a regular room, um, coming back into the work area, you can just grab some hand sanitizer off the wall. That'll be fine. 
far as other equipment that we'll need, you need gauze. Um, we don't use cotton balls if we can avoid it, so you'll use the little gauze squares. Usually we use what are called two by twos. So if someone asks you for a two by two, they mean a little two by two, two inches by two inches piece of gauze. Um, there's four by fours and bigger and better. Uh, bandages, you can either have a band-aid or you'll have Coflex, which is like a self-adhesive uh, bandage. Um, slides, we don't use those very often. Well, we have a, a guest lecture in class about that. You need something to write on, write on your labels. You want to be non-smearing ink and then something to tell the time with. Okay. Other equipment are your needles and your sharps. So anything that's pointy and sharp and could hurt you, like cut your skin, is considered a sharp uh, item. So needles, lancets, uh, glass slides, glass tubes, anything that could puncture your skin. That'll go into a sharps container. Those containers are rigid, puncture resistant, leak proof, disposable containers that have the biohazard symbol on them and a locking lid. We do not overfill these. We only fill them to where the fill line is, which is usually about the two thirds, three quarters mark. Because you don't want to be dropping something into the top of them and then having it be so full that there's needles sticking out the top, you would poke yourself, right? Then you also have biohazard bags, and we have small bags that are leak-proof that you can transport specimens from, say, up on the floors down to the lab. Um, they're also marked with biohazard symbol, but you also see biohazard bags that are used in larger containers, like these large bags right here, this one on the bottom. That would be... Um, a biohazard bag that would maybe be in a, a biohazard can like a, a liner for that and that would be what we collect things that are biohazardous so they're covered in, in blood or body fluids to the point where they could drip so that's going to be a gauze pad that if you squeezed it it would drip or a non-absorbent material like a glove or a piece of tubing something plastic or or something like that that has blood or body fluids on it if you shook it the blood would come right off it because it's non-absorbent that stuff goes into the biohazard can whereas sharps are going to go into like one of these boxes you can see they're red yellow sometimes they're clear they don't have to be any particular color as long as they have the sticker on the side and then these are smaller ones these are a little bit bigger than the tubes they hold tubes you know individual specimens um, other devices that we need, we need a tourniquet. Tourniquets are applied to the arm about three or four inches above where you actually want to stick. Um, you only, we want to tie it tight enough so that it keeps the venous blood, like it restricts that and prevents it from flowing out of the arm and causes the veins to, to fill up, to inflate. But we don't want it so tight that we restrict arterial flow. We don't want it to hurt, okay? So if a patient tells you it's too tight, then it's too tight. Um, by, by restricting the blood flow, we make the veins easier to feel because they fill up with blood and make them big and poofy. Um, but it also stretches that vein wall. By filling it up like that, it stretches the vein wall nice and thin and makes it easier to pierce, which actually makes it less painful. Some things to keep in mind, and this is very important, you have to take the tourniquet off after one minute, no longer than one minute, because otherwise it starts changing the blood components. And in another chapter, we'll be talking about what specifically that change is called and how it works. But for right now, right now, you just need to know that you can't leave the tourniquet on for more than one minute. You have to tie it in such a way that allows for a one-handed quick release. And we usually use disposable tourniquets, ones that we'll throw away after every patient or every other patient or so, over reusable ones. Because reusable ones, you have to clean and sanitize between each patient, and most people just don't do that. So we don't usually use those kind anymore. Um, there are vein finding devices. Those are in your book. I have some links here in the in the um, notes. You can look at those. I have never used one. Uh, where I used to work, the nursery had one, and they weren't they wouldn't allow anybody to play with them. Uh, they used them only when they needed to, because I think they're just so afraid that it would break, and it was very expensive. This is a long time ago now, but they have newer ones, and they are expensive, and they do work good. But as you know, I think it takes the fun out of it. But if you really really needed one, you can check out some of the cool videos they have now. They have newer technology makes these things work really good now too. So there's different kinds of needles, right? Needles, all of them are sterile, which means they're going to be individually wrapped or they're going to have a cap on it with a sticker that shows that it's not been broken and that it's sterile inside. They're disposable and they're single use. So we stick them and then we toss them, right? There's three types. You have multi-sample needles, hypodermic needles, and winged infusion needles, which are also known as butterflies. I will use those terms interchangeably. So that way you know that. Hypodermic needles, you'll sometimes hear me refer to as straight needles or syringe needles because they really only hook up to syringes, okay? Multi-sample needles, you might hear me refer to those as ETS needles. Uh, you might hear other people in the world call them vacutainers, things like that. So on the needle, 
we have a slide later on that shows you all of this. There's some parts that you need to know. The most common part you're going to hear me talk about is the bevel. It's the slanted part. When you see the, the needle in lab, you'll know what I'm talking about a little bit more clearly. The needle has to have the bevel up when you stick. So that's why you'll hear me talk about that. The gauge is another thing you'll hear us talk about when we talk about needles. It's the number that's related to the diameter of the lumen. So what's the lumen? The lumen is the, di the internal space of the needle. It determines how big the needle is. If you think of gauges, if you know anything about piercings, piercing gauges are the same size as this kind of gauge. It's all a needle. Okay. So the higher the gauge, the smaller the diameter. So a 21 gauge is a larger needle than a 23 gauge. Okay, the 23 is a bigger number, the diameter gets smaller. So the needles get smaller as the numbers get bigger. Most of the time these are color coded according to the manufacturers and most of the manufacturers follow the same color coding. So 21s are green, 22s are black, and 23s are blue. Where they put that, you may or may not notice it. Sometimes it's on the needle itself, sometimes it's on the package. It just depends. You'll get used to it as we use them more often in class. The length of the needle can vary and it really doesn't um, change much about the what we're doing unless you're working with a very large obese person and you need to go much deeper. You wouldn't want to use a short, short needle. But generally speaking, we don't really care how long the needles are, but this way at least you're familiar with it. Sometimes you'll see them at an inch long, sometimes you'll see them about an inch and a half. I've got both in the lab. The butterfly needles are usually between a half and three quarter of an inch. Uh, they're usually just a little bit shorter, which makes them a little less scary looking, but it's not like we jam the whole inch and a half of the needle in from the multi-sample, but that's okay. Um, there are safety features according to there's rules that say you have to have a safety on your needle whether it's on the needle or on the the thing that the needle attaches to um, regardless it must permanently contain the needle it has to be able to be activated using one hand which should stay behind the needle at all times I do have some pictures of that in a few moments and we will definitely be going over that in the lab so the ETS system is the most common and efficient system it's most preferred by CLSI. It's closed. It's the blood flows into the needle, from the vein, right into the collection tube. It doesn't get exposed to anything. There's no need to transfer anything. So it allows you to collect numerous tubes. This is probably what you're most familiar with. That's where they pop the needle in your arm and put a tube on, take it off, put another tube on, put another tube on, and you just keep going. That's ETS, evacuated tube system. They call it that because they put on tubes that have been evacuated so that they have this vacuum created inside of them so that allows it to automatically fill. Um, we use multi-sample needles with that, okay? It's threaded in the middle. It has a bevel point on each end. Um, we'll look at this in a lot more detail in lab. We'll talk about what the sleeve is that prevents the blood from leaking, that makes it a multi-sample needle. That screws onto the tube holder. You'll hear these called vacutainers a lot because that's a common brand. Um, sometimes I call them the hub because, it, and it's not technically the hub, but you'll hear us call it that. Um, it has little flanges on the ends called wings, and you do need to use those to take the tube on and off. It helps you keep still when you remove the, the, the tubes. Um, and either, like I said, the tube or the needle holder must have the safety on it. Ah, here's my slide. All right, so in this picture here, there's no safety, but in this picture there is. So this is the bevel. It's a little slanted part, and there's a needle down here with a little sheath sleeve over top of it, and it's got a bevel as well. So this whole thing here screws into this, the tube holder. So this part down here screws into the top part right there. And when that's all screwed together, then you take your tube and you see how it pushes that, sh that uh, sleeve up, pops onto this needle here. The top of the needle out here goes into the skin. So this is what that looks like all together. And in this case, the safety is attached to the needle holder. I have more over here. So this one, the, the safety is this pink thing. The thumb is behind the point of the needle in tube A here. Okay. And that's, this one is B and the needle is, the hand is behind the needle and they're using the table to activate it. And in this one, the, the safety is attached to the hub. These ones up here, this box on the top right corner, those are actually automatically activated safeties. I don't have any of those. They're expensive, but uh, what happens is when you push in the needle, it like trigger something so that when you take the needle out of the arm after you put your tubes on and off everything's great it actually activates this thing as you pull out it goes chink and this little sheath comes out and covers the needle and keeps it protected it's kind of cool so the evacuated tubes here you go they are used with the ets system we also use them with syringes we just have to transfer it using a transfer device which i have a picture on another slide they look a little different depending on what brand you are the ones on top are called vacuettes the ones on the bottom are called bd BD. Um, they come in different sizes. They have different color 
tops, which all signify different additives that are inside. They can be made of plastic or glass. Most places use plastic because of safety issues. You don't want a glass tube breaking with blood in it because then you're more likely to get cut and then exposed. So most places have switched to plastic tubes. Inside of each tube is a vacuum. It's a negative pressure. This is why they fill automatically. It's set by the, the manufacturer and you're supposed to let the tube fill until the vacuum is exhausted. So basically let the tube fill up till it stops filling. It won't fill to the very tippity top, but it should fill up most of the way. If the tube isn't full all the way, as full as it wants to be, then the additive, the amount of additive in there might be too much or then what that blood, let me start again. If you don't let the tube fill up all the way, it means there'll be more additive in that tube than there than than it's made to to work with that amount of blood. So the amount of additive that's added in every tube is set to go with a certain amount of blood so that it's the right mix, the right ratio of additive to blood. If you underfill your tube with too little blood, then you'll have too much additive. I hope that makes sense because I have trouble saying it. Um, now we're going to talk about additive tubes. Okay. Additive tubes means that these tubes have substances added to them other than the tube stopper. They have a specific function, so it's either going to prevent the blood from clotting and be called an anticoagulant, or it's going to aid the blood in clotting and make it clot faster, and that's going to be called a clot activator. Okay, and now these additives that prevent or aid clotting also sometimes will preserve the components within the blood. More often than not, we're talking about whether or not they keep the blood from clotting or not, and how they do that is how it preserves the blood components, all right? So we have non-additive tubes too. The tubes will specifically say non-additive or additive free. A lot of people seem to think that our red top tubes are non-additive, but unless it says non-additive, those red tops do have an additive in it. We'll be talking about what those are later. Your non-additive tubes are generally used for clear or discard purposes. We'll talk a little bit about those later on. Um, <clears throat> so don't worry about that too, too much right now. The stoppers, the things that go on top of the tubes are generally made of rubber, but some will have a plastic shield over top and we'll, we'll show you that in lab. So the tubes are color coded. Okay. That's why we call them red tops or blue tops or whatever. It's usually universal, mo meaning most blue tops are the same across the board, no matter who made them. But every now and then you find some exceptions to the different colors. Um, each tube also has written on it a, an expiration date. You're not supposed to use the tube past its expiration date because that means that the, the vacuum in it and the additive in it are no longer guaranteed to work appropriately. So you want to make sure that you're using those uh, appropriately. But remember that in the lab, we use donated tubes, many of which are expired. So you wouldn't normally use expired tubes in the lab, but we do in class because we have a limited budget So and we're not testing our blood. It doesn't matter if the additive doesn't work because we're not doing anything that anybody's health relays on. But I do want you to get in the habit of looking at those expiration dates, you know. It's kind of fun too when you find a really old one in the class. Okay, so we'll talk more about those specific additives in a little bit. So the syringe system, this is where we're going to take a hypodermic needle and we're going to hook it up to a plastic syringe. And these syringes have either a lure lock, looks like a screw top, or a slip tip where you just slip the tip of the needle into, uh, or slip the syringe into the needle. Again, these also must have a, a safety device of some kind. Um, you'll see them in different sizes. The syringes come in small, like two or three. You, they come in smaller than that. You can even have one, one cc syringes. Like I do my B12 uh, shots with a one cc syringe. Um, insulin's given in one cc syringe. But generally for like what we're doing, we'll use either a two to three milliliter uh, syringe, a five milliliter syringe, or a 10 milliliter syringe. You'll also see milliliter or cc. They kind of are, they're totally interchangeable. A lot of times, like your fives and your tens, they actually hold an, an extra cc or two than what they say. So like a 10 cc syringe, it actually holds 12. So you have to kind of look at how do you know which size to use. It's going to vary depending on the patient's veins. So if the veins are real big and plump, you can use a bigger syringe, no problem. If they're really teeny tiny, then you might want to use a smaller one. But it also depends on how much blood you need. If you need 10 cc's of blood for testing, you can't use a 2 milliliter syringe to get 10 cc's of blood. It just doesn't work, right? Okay, so when we're talking about the syringe, we're talking about the barrel, which is what actually fills up. It's the cylinder part. It's got the markings on it and the plunger. That's the part that fits inside the barrel that you pull back on. Okay, when we pull back on the plunger, we pull back gently. We create a slight vacuum in the barrel and it causes it to fill up with blood. We want to let the blood keep up with the plunger. If we pull too fast, we'll, we can cause damage to the red blood cells and that's called hemolysis and we don't want that. 
when we're using a syringe, we have to use a transfer device. We don't just finish filling the blood out of the arm and then jam that needle into a tube. You might see videos of people doing that, and you might even see people doing it out of clinicals, but OSHA requires us to use a uh, transfer device to be safe. Okay, and we always want to transfer our blood into our tube so that the tube is vertical and filling from the bottom up. Whoop, too fast. So this is a transfer device. It looks like the ETS needle, like half the ETS needle with a needle in the inside. So we screw that onto our syringe, we pop our tube on, everything's hunky-dory. So then we talk about butterfly needles. So butterfly needles can be hooked up to either a syringe or like the ETS on the end, okay? It's gonna consist of this needle hooked up with through all this tubing, okay? Hooked up to either a syringe or an ETS. If you have an ETS on there, you pop the tubes on and off just like anything else. If you have a syringe on the end, you pull the plunger back. It all, excuse me, looks the same. We will be doing this all in lab, so we're not going to uh, discuss it too heavily right here. They have safety device devices too. They work a little bit differently, but again, they're supposed to be able to be used with just one hand as well. When you have to fill one of these, the kind on the, the right with the ETS end right here, that's the butterfly. When you're doing one of those first and you're filling a blue top tube, you have to use a clear tube, okay? Because the air and the tubing will fill up part of that tube and it'll actually create um, a little bit of a gap, a little bit of air bubble, and it will prevent the tube from filling up all the way. So we want to make sure that with blue top tubes being filled this way, we use a clear tube first. We can either use another blue top or a non-additive tube. Um, we can use small tubes. So we wouldn't want to necessarily hit a, a 10 cc red top on a on a 23 gauge butterfly. We'd want to do maybe the the four milliliter red top tube on a 23 gauge butterfly. Because otherwise we can have hemolysis and we'll talk more about how that works, okay? My thoughts on butterflies, I think that they're great on difficult patients or they're great when you need to get blood from, a lot of blood from the hand and ETS can't be used or you're doing blood cultures or the patient insists. But I do not think that these are, these are not required for just because a patient has hard veins does not mean you have to use a butterfly. I've gotten the most difficult patients with a syringe needle. I've even gotten them with the ETS. Um, butterflies are good for when they're good, but you do not want to let them be a crutch for you like a lot of people do. I know, I know philatomists that can only draw blood using um, butterflies, and that's disturbing because sometimes you don't have a butterfly available to you. I work, Where I used to work, they used to get locked up. We, they would get um, back order sometimes, so you had to be really kind of stingy with your butterflies. We'll talk more about that in lab. All right. I'm going to stop the recording right now. We're already at about 25 minutes, and we'll pick up on part two of chapter seven. I don't think there's a whole lot left um, on the next lecture. Okay.